my name is Dedi. I'm in charge of the Israeli Division Group in Manchester. We're going to talk today about four different things. We're going to talk about Magic Paper One, which is our basically latest product we released about three months ago, something like that. I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about how we do it, the basic supervision uh, components, and what are our focus on when we build those. We're going to talk about the future and where huh? we focus um, on the environment moving forward, and we're going to talk about Magic Leap Israel. Well. Magic Leap 1. So, a little bit of history. This is how it all started. This is uh, how our device looked like not so long ago, at the end of 2014. So that one was called the Beast, and all the user could, could do with it is see a little green dot and move it around using a joystick um, in the 3D space. That's only four years ago. That's that's what we had four years ago. And then we moved on with the cheese head. So that's this device here. And that one was able to produce still RGB images, full RGB images, but no um, computer vision features, no spatial nothing of that sort, only still RGB images and nothing more. And then we moved on to our uh, developer hardware series. We had three hardware prototypes called WD1, WD2, WD stands for wearable device, and the WD3, this is the one that you're seeing here. Uh, those were tethered devices, so connected with cables to a PC, and not fully wearable, not fully embedded. Uh, the algorithms that we used uh, those devices were not fully embedded, not fully productized, uh, but we were able to use that platform to support content development and R&D research and, and practically all the development that we did for around two years or so, something like that. But again, that was tethered without fully operational algorithms. And then came the Magic Leap 1. Magic Leap 1 is comprised out of three basic components. The first one is a 6 degrees of freedom controller, which is basically used as a UX instrument uh, to support the user interactions in inside the baby space. It also, it also provides haptic feedback, uh, among other feedback that it provides. Uh, the second component is the light pack, that's the device that you're seeing all the way to the right. Uh, it contains the battery and the computer, so most of the computer sources that we supply as part of this device. Uh, and the computer sources that we supply to support our computer vision infrastructures, but also for our developer tools. And last but not least is the light well itself, the device here in the middle. Uh, basically, it contains two basic and uh, uh, important elements. The first one is the dis display itself, but the second one, which is of more interest at least for me, uh, is uh, the, CV, uh, the CPU processor, which basically is in charge of the latency-sensitive computer vision uh, computations. That's what we have on the right. Uh, we are very proud to have so many input methods uh, supplied with our device. So we have head pose, which is basically where the user is in terms of six degrees of freedom inside the 3D space, in terms of X, Y, Z, or H, and Yaw. We have eye gaze, which basically means the vertex point where the user is looking at, at 3D space and 3D coordinates. We have the six of controller that we already talked about. Uh, we have gestures that we'll talk about in a few slides, um, voice control, a mobile app, and also a keyboard that can be connected uh, using Bluetooth uh, to our device. Uh, in the next movie, you'll be able to see most of those input methods come into play, in addition to an, an additional service that uh, the computer vision infrastructure provides, which is water construction. So you'll be able to see um, uh, if you pay close attention, you'll be able to see gestures, you'll be able to see 3D meshing, dynamic occlusions, and many more. This is Dr. G, a game that we published a, while, a few weeks ago uh, in Nipcon, um, which again takes into account all the different input methods and water construction as well. How we do it? Now, you'll see we have four basic computer vision uh, features that we are developing among many others, but those are the, the big four. And the challenge is not only to meet the accuracy and robustness uh, specs that we define for ourselves, but also to do that in the most efficient way possible, because we are very, very sensitive to the amount of compute that we take, because the more compute that we use, it means 
the rest of the grid, which is available for the app developers. And we are also very sensitive for the amount of power that we require for all those infrastructure to work. The first one is HeadPose, which provides tracking, mapping, and localization, and we'll cover that in a sec. The second one is Vault Construction, which provides a 3D reconstruction, 3D mesh reconstruction of the environment, in addition to several semantic labeling that we're also doing and providing to the app developers. Eye tracking, uh, which provides a 3D vertex point of the user, and hand tracking as well. Headbox is maybe the most basic component uh, in our device and devices such as AI, such as ours and AI devices, because that's the basic element which allows us to render the content in the right place. We have, we have fully utilized VIO pipeline, visual and natural geometry pipeline, which takes into account visual sensory data in addition to IMU data, and fuses everything together in the most efficient way possible to provide um, headphones, which means our accuracy and robustness specs. In addition to where the user is uh, inside the lady's space in terms of the six degrees of freedom which describe where he is, we also provide local um, coordinate frames, we call that PCF, or persistent coordinate frames, is such that when we optimize the map, when we optimize where the device thinks that, thinks that it is, we do the optimization in the sense that it expects local environments. And this is why we're defining local coordinate systems, and not only a single coordinate system, a single global coordinate system, when we try to optimize uh, that all the time. So that's called PCF, this is exposed as part of our SDK. Localization. So localization is a very important piece, and sometimes it is a bit neglected, but it's a very, very important and, 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 and uh, difficult to achieve piece of our pipeline. So what does localization, what does it give us? It gives us the ability to support persistency and sharing. Persistency is the term which is used to describe that if I come to a room, leave a virtual object there, and go back another day, and the, the virtual object stays at the same place. Sharing is what happens once I enable that virtual object as public, thus allowing other users uh, to see the same virtual object in that audience frame in that specific space in time. And the localization process is built from three different steps. steps. The first step is map selection. So we have the entire AR cloud, a big cloud which describes all the physical space in virtual terms, and we need to pick the local map, a chunk from that entire AR cloud, which describes our current local environment. And that's the first process that we need to do, to pick a local map from the entire AR cloud that describes the entire world. The second step, once we found the local map and we brought it into our device, we are now doing pose estimation. We're trying to link ourselves, to link our device to that specific map that not necessarily was created by our device and to say where we are relative to that map. And the reason why we do all that is for eventually to get uh, our relative position to the PCFs, to the local coordinate frames that we define, because all the content is placed relative to that, to those uh, local coordinate frames. So at the end of this process, we can see persistent content or content which was shared with me uh, using uh, the device uh, features of sharing. Wall deconstruction. So wall deconstruction provides three basic elements uh, which are basic for our app developers in our field. The first one is visual occlusion, so basically identify uh, objects and meshes in the room and build meshes of the room in order to occlude virtual content. So in the left image here you can see a lamp which occludes the virtual content which is projected on the wall. The second element is to provide physics based interactions. For example, if there's a slope in the room and we want to place a virtual ball on that slope, so from the mesh understanding, from the understanding of the environment, we get physics uh, oriented uh, interactions and the ball will simply roll as it should roll in the real space, in the real world. Last but not least is environmental reasoning. So uh, this means that we're not only providing a 3D mesh when we build a mesh, we do not only provide the 3D mesh itself, but we also provide it with semantic information. What's the wall from that entire, uh, inside that, that space space? Where is the floor? What's a table? What's a couch? For app developer, developer, developers to be able to uh, build complex interactions, 
using that semantic information and not only using the mesh itself, only for the image consumption. We take all the sensory and data inputs, the visual sensors, and I new additional sensors that we have in order to build that image consumption and extract semantic information as well. And I can tell you that optimizing that entire structure on embedded hardware is a very difficult task to achieve. Um, it's very confused hungry and it requires a lot of optimization to achieve that in real time uh, on embedded platforms. Gestures. So we basically provide two basic uh, different services in terms of gestures. One is eight different gestures that the device can identify and those can be used as UX events in order to control the device. But the second feature is we provide nine 3D key points tracking in order to allow natural interactions inside the 3D space. So for example, you could pick up a flower using those uh, um, 3D key points tracking, pick up a flower and not only do events using gestures with the device. So these are the two services that we provide. Uh, we provide four different ways for app developers to develop using our device. We provide an SDK for Unity, an SDK for Unreal Engine, our own Lumen SDK, and also a web development platform, it is called Helio, that you can build applications and experiences using web development tools um, on our business. A few words about the future, about where we focus our R&D efforts and our attention moving forward. This is Mica. Mica is an AI companion. This is very different from an assistance that we may be used to on other platforms. She's an AI companion, and our goal that we have a team in Magic Leap called HCAI, which is called Human Centered AI. Our goal is to provide as human as possible interactions with our AI companion. This is very different from an assistant, and it defines um, where we invest our efforts in making the interaction as human as possible, as pleasant as possible, as fluent as possible for a human being. This is why this entire group is called Human Centered AI. So Micah is a big thing um, in our future plans. The second big thing is the magic verse. Now the magic verse, uh, like many people interpret that in many different ways, but basically the magic verse is a virtual representation of space which allows us to share content and have content persistent across multiple devices, not only Magic Leap devices. That's the goal. So it's basically a sparse representation of the world with semantic information as well. So again, where we have a floor, where there's a wall, semantic information as well, which allows you to link yourself to it, meaning to compute your relative pose relative to that specific uh, AR cloud map, AR map, and uh, to share content and to have content which persists in the world. So this is the magic. <coughs> Doing that in large scale requires, again, quite a lot of novelty uh, in order to uh, support all the complex computations in a reasonable way which are behind these kind of technologies. Now, moving forward, our focus in Magic Leap is obviously to increase the accuracy of our algorithms features that we provide, increase the robustness of the algorithms that we develop, the, the infrastructure that we supply, but also to significantly reduce as much as possible the compute consumption and the power consumption. This is why we are very much uh, interested in, in academia work such as these, which do pixel crunching once. They take, you can see the RGB image in the top left. This is the only input to that specific deep learning network. And the output basically gives two outputs. One is depth computation uh, from that single RGB image, so it's the computation per image. And the second is semantic labeling of the environment. And those can be fused in order to create what you see on the right image. Six degrees of freedom, freedom goes where the user is, where the user is, a three-day construction of the environment, and also semantic labeling, what's a wall, what's a floor, what's a bed, and what's a pillow. This is what more, uh, small structure of what we see here. And we are very much interested in academic works such as these, which do the pixel crunching once, but allow you to deduct a lot based on those 
computations on this first pass over the pixels. The, the second paper is even more interesting than the first one. Again, the input is, this is a query image, this is the only input, and it provides 17 different outputs. You can see 2D edges, 2D key points, semantic labeling, uh, scene classification, object classification, and many more. 17 different outputs based on the first few layers of the network, which does, which do the pixel crunching itself. So, a few layers of pixel crunching, and then multiple different heads for the network to extract to the different features to provide the different outputs that you can see here. This is called Ascolomy, it's from Stanford, if I remember correctly. And we are very much interested in works like this. We believe that this is the future um, for computer vision and AI. Uh, in Magic Leap, so we have um, quite a lot of internal research that we're doing in Magic Leap. We publish uh, some of it. So we have, here we can see two different works. One is Superpoint. Superpoint uh, is a slam feature. It's a feature which is specifically constructed, it's a, sorry, it's a detector and a descriptor, which was specifically designed for slam systems. Like a slam system is like a, a technical term for uh, algorithms such as head pose that we described before. So that's the, the first work. The second work is what can we do? Can we build uh, a fully uh, deepified SLAM system in the sense that we won't use features, we won't fe use descriptors and all those technical terms from computer vision, but we only use the default uh, images, images that are coming from the sensors and compute feature matches or eventually SLAM out of those. And this is what we can see here on the right. Uh, on the right. So the input are two different images and the output is point matching and detections and matching is done inside the leaf network itself. Uh, Magic in Israel. So we have offices in Haifa and in Tel Aviv. Uh, we're working on a lot of the stuff that we just described here in this lecture. Uh, we have open positions. We have hardware positions, computer vision positions, cyber security positions. You're more than welcome to reach out. Uh, this is our website, you can reach out to me also if you want, um, and that's basically it.